I was doing a lot of nothing in my 20s. I had been to college for seven years, got about 30 credits, and a lot of student loans. I loved comedy and stand-up comedy and was a big fan. And there was probably a, somewhere there a desire to try it. I finally went to the improv on audition night, the improv in New York City. And I got up on stage at about 1.30 in the morning and I got, actually got laughs on a lame five minute routine that I wrote. And that was all it took. I still chickened out, like the next time I got on stage, totally bombed, gave it up for two years, chickened out, but it was there. I moved out of my mother's house, I was 29. <laughs> <laughs> if I had known yeah. he was such a loser, yeah, I don't yeah. know if I would have gotten into business Are you with kidding? this guy. That's why we're here, because uh, losing sells. Yeah. He was the futon delivery, I think. Yeah. Oh, no, no, oh, no. In the he banker. worked for UPS. <laughs> oh, UPS. <laughs> UPS. Wait, futon, UPS, and then he goes, I'm going to do stand-up full-time. This is the summer before we're getting married. And I said, all right, I guess. Sure, why not, you know? I started progressing as a comedian, moving up the ranks, I guess, if you want to call it that. A couple of little TV shows, the MTV Half Hour Comedy, comedy was taking off then. The cable shows, the evening at the Improv, this and that. The, finally, The Tonight Show in 91 with Johnny, right before he retired. Uh, HBO Young Comedian Special. You know, I started doing all the shows that, you, that, the, that the comics established comics were doing. My dog is old, he's 14, which is, uh, if you're a dog owner, this is like a tough, it's a tough time because we have to make a decision with him soon and it's, you know, it's hard. We've had him for a long time, but you can tell little things that he's just not gonna be around too much longer. I mean, with him it's like, well, we throw him baloney, he can't catch it, it just sticks to his face. <laughs> How much longer does he have with us? It's, uh... Ray was doing his stand-up and I was, let's see, I was home with three kids. My daughter was five and they were two and a half, two and a half. Ray was home during the day, so he was actually very helpful with the kids and then he'd work at night, so it was perfect timing. I'd put them to bed and he'd go to work and, you know, it was a quiet time. In the course of doing my stand-up, one guy had seen me and wanted me for something and that was Paul Sims from, uh, from news radio, the creator of news radio, had me come out and audition, and I got the part of, well, he then be, he became the janitor, but he was an office worker. One rehearsal he was at, one rehearsal. But like, I'm so excited, I'm like, oh, yay, we're it's gonna get happening. out of here, yeah, <laughs> we're gonna get out of here, you know? And um, he calls me the next day at like seven o'clock in the morning, I'm like, hi, Ray, he goes, well, I'm coming home, I'm like, what are you talking about? You're coming home? He's like, yeah, they're going in a different direction. I'm like, oh, God, no, no, you know. I went back to stand-up, and then four months later is when I did my Letterman spot, and I had a very good spot. As Even for my standards, I kind of hate, you know, myself and hate what I do, but even I had to admit this went pretty good. Thank you. Well, thank you. I have a three-year-old daughter and twin two-year-old boys. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Single people are here. <laughs> we were watching Letterman the night that Ray was on. I remember we were sitting there, and I always would get nervous when the comics would come on because they would bomb, and then, like, you know, like, oh, you're man, a mother you watching it. these children, like, you know, lose it. And this one time, the comic came on, and we were laughing. And I remember he did the thing with the jiggling, the keys. Oh, uh, yeah. I tell you, I'm losing my perspective on adult humor. It, if I, I wrote one new joke since my twins were born. Here, is this funny? What do you think it is? Hi. <laughs> Thank God. I'm glad. I'm glad you laughed. If you didn't laugh at that, I would have had to come and rub my nose in your bellies. Yeah. Oh. And then I got back home, and I remember telling my manager, you know, I, there aren't many more shows to do to get the exposure. You know, and that one really, I, I kind of did pretty good there. People don't 
have any interest after seeing that, you know, this could be it. And nothing happened. And a week later, it was a Saturday afternoon. I remember it was summer. We were out in the backyard, our little, you know, like 10 by 10 backyard in our little pool that we got at, you know, a drugstore, <laughs> whatever. And um, the kids are splashing around and Ray got that phone call. Like we thought about this might happen eventually, but it wasn't reality, you know? It's like, it'll happen to everybody else, but not us. It was Rob Burnett, who was the producer then, it still is, but he was more involved then with The Letterman Show, called up, called my house, called me, and said, hey, this is Rob Burnett, and uh, just to let you know, we've been talking about you and your set, and we loved it, and we're interested in talking about some, something in a, you know, in a development deal. And just to let you know, we're in the talking stages, so if anyone else calls, just, you know, consider us first. And, of course, I told them right then, nobody's calling, man. I'm in. <laughs> I started out in New York. Uh, I was a character actor in New York, and uh, it's hard to get work as an actor. So I thought maybe if I wanted to eat something besides tuna fish for dinner every night, I, I would try writing. So that led to uh, some jobs in TV, uh, working for little shows that maybe you heard of, maybe you didn't. My first job was the Robert Mitchum sitcom. It lasted seven episodes. Then I went from that to Baby Talk and Down the Shore with, uh, with my friend Alan Kirschenbaum and, and uh, let's see, Coach for three years, uh, the middle three years of Coach I was a writer on. And it was during that third year that uh, I got a tape uh, from a comedian. And I popped the tape in, and I remember I had seen this guy on The Letterman Show when it was originally broadcast, because I watched Letterman all the time. And I remember thinking he was funny then, and then I saw the tape, and it, they were looking for somebody to uh, write a show for this stand-up, as, as usually happens uh, with stand-ups and show deals this way. And I said, this guy's funny. And I said to my wife, you know, I love this bit that he does with the with the keys with the thing and he was mm. I just liked his personality and uh, they were interviewing a bunch of guys to see who was right and reading uh, material so I got lucky and I got unlucky <laughs> <laughs> you should be sorry you can, you can have that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We at CBS had a deal with Worldwide Pants, which is David Letterman's company, and they had a development fund where they were, you know, planning to make deals with comedians, make deals with writers, and try and develop comedies for television. So we looked at the tape. We liked him. We didn't love him. We said, all right, he's interesting, you know, little, you know, low-key. So we said, okay, let's, uh, you know, more out of courtesy to David Letterman did we get the project started. When Worldwide Pants was looking for a partner, they were also looking for a writer. And we had had a relationship with several writers, including Phil Rosenthal, who we had worked with on a show called Down the Shore. And that's when I met this guy. We met on Ventura Boulevard over here at Arts Deli, where every sandwich is a work of art. <laughs> and uh, we hit it off. You know, he, he, he told me stories about his crazy family. And I had a few of my own. Yeah, we matched stories. We matched crazy yeah. relative stories. And uh, then we said, you know, well, let's take a crack at this, you know. Well, I had to go back and figure out. I, sp I, I met 12 people in about two or three days. Lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast. And I had to just sit down and think, who did I hit it off with? Who did I have a rapport? Who did I thought I related to the best? You and know? was I your first choice? No. Tell no, me. actually, you... Tell the people. No, I, no, there were one On the two. record. Yeah. I knew in my gut, uh, you're probably the, the guy where, where, which was, we had more in, I had more in common with. And you're not just saying that now for the DVD. You no, see. no. Well, the truth is, I, I said, what about, what about this other guy? And he wasn't available. So they, they, they answered it for me. Thank not you that very we, much. Not that we would have went with him anyway. It's a pleasure to be here. But after. that made the decision easier. Phil and Ray, they were very simpatico. Um, I think what contributed to the success of the series is, even though one was Italian and one was Jewish, they had very similar family experiences. I think we both come from kind of funny families, where the way to deal with stuff was kind of uh, sometimes more caustic than, than gentle, but humor. Colorful, colorful family. Right. <laughs> when we met and decided, you know, 
what should the show be about? We, it didn't come pre-packaged. We had to sit and talk about, well, what should the show be? Phil said, you know, if I'm going to develop a show about this guy, I, I have to know what he is. I, I think he always used to say, I'm not going to make Ray Romano a, a gay astronaut from Australia or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do something that's very close to him. Right. Here's someone who really didn't have a lot of acting experience, so you want to keep the show close to who he is so he's comfortable. Well, that seemed yeah. like a smart thing to do. Well, I knew at the news radio, I knew this better be as close to me as possible. And the, 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 <laughs> like, what job will he have? Well, the, the job of comedian in 1996 was already taken by yeah. Mr. Seinfeld, so we couldn't do that. So let's see. The relationship with him and his wife is a, such a classic male-female relationship. So what makes him even more of a male? Something with sports. So well, we, well, we, we thought let's make it something somewhat creative, something like stand up where it's yeah. creative and takes me out of the house. Right. Which uh, eventually we never really use that anyway, because no, you the never show see takes me. place yeah. in the house. Yeah, yeah. We did a few episodes but, where you go out there, but we, we soon realized that but the, the gold is. Yes, with but the desire to try to keep it as close to me as possible, stand, something that creative out of the house. So uh, we came up with a sports writer, but but. In, in essence, we didn't really need the taking out of the house thing because I'm never at work. You could have <laughs> just been a, uh, someone who inherited money and never has to work. Yes. Yeah. All my stand-up yeah. was about me and my wife and a little bit about, about the, the Italian mother and this and that. Right. Yeah. I had stories about my father, but I never incorporated them. Well, this the was the thing. He starts telling me about his twin boys and how his parents live close by in Queens, very close by like down the street, maybe not across the street, but down the street. And, and, and the uh, brother. And, and the, the brother. brother who's a cop and who actually eats yes. with, with touching to his chin first and maybe is a little jealous of Raymond. In fact, there was a, a story that he told where uh, your brother came to see your Cable Ace Award. Yeah, he was walking through the house. My brother was a cop and he had this lighthearted jealousy, you know, where he would speak about it, but in a, in a light way, you know. And then one day he was in my house and you know, it's one achievement after another. And he looks at a, an award on my desk and he's like, what's this? And my mother said, well, that's a Cable Ace Award that Ray won. And he just looked at me and went, never ends for Raymond. Oh, poor Robbie. Everybody loves Raymond. He's telling me these, these little stories and I'm saying, well, a couple of things. First of all, it's all very funny. Second of all, if I just do this, I don't have to work very hard. I don't have to create that much if I just take his life. Not even his stand-up. We're going beyond his stand-up. We're going into his actual personal life. Here's a good exercise. You think you know who's who? Matthew Gregory. Okay, you got it? Okay, now we shuffle him. Come over here. You can back over here. Keeping your eye on him? Okay. Where's Gregory? Ray's dad actually did uh, call your house and yeah, write he to used the to, answering um, machine? He, used, he found out the code to uh, my answering machine in real life. Found out how to play the messages back. Well, while you're talking to him, would you mind mentioning the answering machine? Oh, is he playing back the messages yes. again? I changed the code. Well, he cracked it. And then he would call my house and leave a message saying and deborah you ought to call linda back she sounds like she had a very interesting visit to the gyno not invasive at all yeah really but my my wife would have caused the uh, outrage <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that's you know it's not for everybody okay <laughs> we put that in the pilot yeah what we didn't put in was he actually took it a step further and found out how to change my outgoing message. And one day we were, out, we were outside and we called to hear our messages. We're calling from the phone and we hear, instead of hearing my voice saying, hey, you've reached Ray and Anna, you hear my father's voice saying, ah, you've reached Ray and Anna. <laughs> yeah, if you want them, leave a message. If you want me, Al Romano, I am at 718, you know, whatever. And my, and my literally my wife cried in tears of not of happiness so thank God yeah. for him you know yeah so thanks thank Albert him. yeah we go and we pitch this right to CBS the the series yeah. idea yeah then when we tell them the premise 
guy lives with his family and his parents live close by, they're nobody's all, jumping up and down for this show. Well, they're you know, also they're in not, business with Worldwide Pants. Yes. So they want to, Letterman has a show, he wants a pitch, we'll hear Letterman's show. Right. You know? yeah. But no one, when we say this premise, they're not like yeah. saying we have our Monday night hit here. That, you know, and to be fair, it's a crapshoot. But they say, go ahead, you know, maybe it's a good script. Maybe, you know, they at least yeah. give us the money to, to, write, a to write a script. Yeah. I go off to write the pilot. And we have to come up with what the story will be. And we came up with a very simple story, which is just, it's going to be Deborah's birthday. And for once, maybe the parents don't come over. You know, honey, every day that you were gone, they dropped by. And then your dad is always waking up the kids. And now they don't even call first. Well, they live across the street. Why should they call? It's quicker just to come by. I know. <laughs> it's like we're on the way. No, no, no. We are the way. We are where they're going. You see, now you're exaggerating. Uh, yeah, home. <laughs> what I don't know about the actual personalities about of these people, uh, I can kind of fill in with the personalities from my family, like my parents, and and the, you know, there's some of my wife in in Deborah, and there's some of me and Ray even, and and uh, sorry, ah! <laughs> in a nice way, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Your birthday gift to me finally came this morning. And did you know you sent me a box of pears? Yeah, yeah. From a place called Fruit of the Month? That's right, that's right. How are they? Oh, they're very nice pears. <laughs> but there's so many of them. I remembered a story that I told at my brother's uh, wedding. I was best man at his wedding, and I got up and I, I told a story, uh, kind of a warning to his new wife of the family she was marrying into. So I, I was kind of an expert on the family she was marrying into. And I told this story about giving my parents a gift of fruit of the month. I thought it would be a nice Hanukkah gift and, and uh, I got a phone call from my mother who was very upset because she got these pears and, and there were so many of them and she didn't know what she was supposed to do with them. Most people like it, Ma. You share it. Share it with all your friends. Which friends? I don't know. Lee and Stan. Lee and Stan buy their own fruit. Oh, oh, give it a why did you throw oh, this for me? Oh, I can't talk. There's too much fruit in the house. Oh, what is happening? Then my father, you know, joined in. What are we, invalids? We can't buy our own fruit? I mean, it, it was like I had sent them plutonium. <laughs> I'm canceling the fruit club. Oh, 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 good. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. And don't do that again. Like we don't have enough problems. <laughs> I write the script, and the first person I sent it to was my friend uh, Jeremy Stevens. On a Saturday afternoon eight years ago, I was I was watching a a game on television, and my phone rang, and Phil was on it, and he said, "Hi, what are you doing?" And I said. Watching a game, he said, I just finished writing a pilot. I'm going to send it over to your house. I want you to get your reaction. And uh, uh, an hour and a half later, his phone rang, and he picked it up, and the first words he heard from me were, we're on for 10 years. The first words out of his mouth were, it's going to run 10 years. Bastard. Yeah, which is, of course, longer than we wanted yeah. to yes. run. But, but right. uh, that was very positive and very encouraging. It's a strange thing that Phil is modest, because Phil being Phil, uh, it, it's tough to be modest when you're that talented, but he is. He's a modest guy, and he's always been. And he said, you liked it. I said, Phil, it's, it's only the best pilot I've ever read. It's hilarious. It's full of heart. It has it, great characters. The relationships are already exploited. It's already a happening family. And so we were right in, we're swept right into the current. I said, it's, I, I said, it's just tremendous, and I love it, and, uh, and that was it. He was drunk, Jeremy. Yeah, I think so, that helped. Yeah. I always send my scripts out with a bottle of something. Yes. <laughs> Every year, I guess we develop a handful of domestic comedies and a handful of workplace ensembles and, and you know, all different kinds of shows. And then it, it's kind of up to the scripts to make them rise above the rest. They had notes to give. They wanted the, the, they wanted the parents to live in the house. Live in the house. They right. wanted the guy not to be a cop, to be a security guard. They had. A, you know, they they had what they thought works, you know. Uh, oh, we had set it in Queens where you really were yeah. living, and they said it should be set out of Queens, so we literally made they, it. They didn't want it in the city. Right, so we made it Long Island. 
Thought, which is next to Queens. It's attached to Queens, but that made it okay. And then it was like just sit and wait to see Can are they going to are they going to film a pilot? Are they going to are they going to uh, commit to filming a pilot? Which is you know investing a million dollars. A million dollars, yeah. Right. And I remember going and doing that show, the the stand up show in Aspen, in CBS with Rosie O'Donnell hosting, when it was still will they do it? Will they not? And I got very lucky. I had a real good set on that show. You know what amazed me in Montreal? I went into a Burger King. The Burger King employees are re required to be bilingual. Just think about that, folks. Have you been to Burger King in our country recently? Oh, oh they're not even lingual here. There's no, you have to draw your food on a hamburger. Hamburger! What do you, uh, put the pie down, I don't want a pie. I hadn't seen Ray perform live. I mean, we'd seen tape of him performing when we made the deal, but I don't think any of us had seen him in front of an audience. And uh, he performed at the Wheeler Opera House in Aspen, and he was unbelievable. I'm a married man, family man. I have a uh, four-year-old daughter and twin two-year-old boys. Yeah, oh, single, 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 single. Oh, you can always tell. It's always a mixed reaction. Single people, ah, twins, yay! Look at the parents, yeah. Oh, oh, that could have been us. Oh, my God! I remember coming back to L.A. and calling Stu Smiley, who produced that event, and saying, you have to get me that tape from that night over here so I can show it to Les, because he's probably only seen, you know, the two minutes Ray did on Letterman. My mother still can't tell him apart. My mother will babysit for us, and she's frightened by it. it she's neurotic. It's, my mother's afraid she's going to keep feeding the same one over and over again. Yeah. A bunch of us sat in Les's office and looked at the tape, and we're like, great, let's do this pilot, because he was fantastic. I never really doubted from the moment I read it what it was going to be. I mean, I just felt this, this just sings too loudly not to be heard. What are you doing? <laughs> okay, we'll try again on my birthday. <laughs>